In a previous discussion, we saw how we can use a linear model to predict the salary of an individual given their age, educational qualifications, and gender as feature values. We also saw how we can use a loss function to search for the best parameter values for this model that could accurately predict the salaries. Calculus is one of the key techniques at the heart of most machine learning algorithms that perform loss minimization. And today we will revisit our calculus basics in a simple and intuitive manner. My beautiful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's get started. Most of us have come across calculus terms such as derivatives at some point. Although we are taught how to compute the derivatives of a function, what does a derivative really mean? Derivatives were invented to help us understand what happens to a function's output value if its input is changed or perturbed a little bit. Let us take the simple quadratic function fx equals x square as an example. Suppose we are at x equals 0.5 and we move 0.1 to the right and land up at 0.6. The function value goes up from 0.25 to 0.36. However, Notice that we could have predicted quite well what would be the new function value simply by multiplying how much we moved to the function derivative and adding that to the old function value. And this is not an accident. No matter what point we start, whether we move left or right, whether the function value is increasing or decreasing at our starting point, this technique always seems to work. Notice that even though we moved 0.1 to the right every time, the function value increased in the first two cases and decreased in the third case. The amount of the increase was also not the same in the first two cases. Also, notice that this trick will fail if we move too much. For example, if we move one unit instead of 0.1 unit, then our approximation seems to become very bad. Actually, for the simple function, it is easy to see that our approximation error is directly linked to how much we moved. If we move delta x, then our error would be delta x squared, which confirms that this trick is guaranteed to work if we move a tiny bit. A more concrete reason behind this phenomenon is a corollary of a mathematical result called Taylor's theorem that is given here. Notice that this result suggests that if our movement has the same sign as the derivative, then the function value will go up after we move, else it will go down after we move. Thus, the derivative tells us two things. Its sign tells us in which direction will the function value increase, left or right. And more importantly, its magnitude tells us if the change in the function value will be large, that is, it will go up or down a lot or whether the change will be small. It is curious that if we arrange this formula given at the top, we arrive at an expression that looks suspiciously like the one that is used in our math textbooks to define the derivative. Of great interest in calculus are points where the derivatives vanish and these are lovingly called stationary points. Stationary points could either be a local minimum, that is a point which achieves the smallest function value but only in a small region surrounding that point, or a global minimum, that is a point which achieves the lowest function value among all points, or a local maximum, or a saddle point term that invokes anxiety in most machine learning enthusiasts. The derivative being zero at a point indicates that a function is flat in that region. However, we might find ourselves disagreeing with the statement when we visually inspect functions. The problem here is the scale. Calculus effects are often visible only at a very small scale for which we will have to enter the quantum realm. Upon zooming in, we find that the function does look flat in the region where the derivative was zero. However, at this point you might be suspicious that maybe all parts of the function look flat because we zoomed in so much. But a bit of looking around confirms that this is not the case. Portions of the function where the derivative was non-zero do not look flat at all even if we zoom in. However, they do start looking an awful lot like straight lines instead of curves. And this is no accident. 
or differentiable functions, once we zoom in enough, the tangent line or the tangent plane in general is guaranteed to give a very good approximation to the function even if the function is very curved. Once we have found out the stationary points of a function, we can separate minima from maxima from saddle points using the second derivative. Although the term may sound intimidating, the second derivative is nothing but a quantity that tells us if the derivative is increasing or decreasing. This relationship between the second and the first derivative is a bit like the relationship between acceleration and velocity. Velocity measures how quickly is the position of a body changing, whereas acceleration tracks how fast is the velocity changing. A stationary point where the derivative is in the process of going from negative to positive creates a cup-like shape which are minima. Note that the second derivative will have a positive sign here since the derivative is going up, it's going from negative to positive. The exact opposite happens for maxima which look like upturned cups since the derivative is in the process of going from positive to negative here. Saddle points are weird creatures where neither of these two possibilities takes place. Also note that there is no general algorithm or recipe to distinguish between local minima and global minima or local maxima and global maxima except in special cases. There are several handy rules that allow us to calculate the derivatives of complicated looking functions quite easily. Take a moment to note these down and see if you can justify that each of these rules do make sense in that they do tell us how the output of let's say the sum or the product of two functions would behave if the input is changed a tiny bit. It would also be nice if you could solve these simple exercises to ensure that you have internalized the concept of derivatives and know when and how to apply the various rules of derivatives. From the quantum realm, we now move into the multiverse. Sorry, wrong channel. We move to multivariate functions that take in a vector as input and output a real number. Multivariate functions are key components of almost all machine learning algorithms, so it's important to study them carefully. However, we will see that the hard work that we did in understanding derivatives really well will pay off here and multivariate calculus will look quite simple to us. Just as before, multivariate functions can have minima, maxima, as well as saddle points. However, unlike the 1D case where we could just move left and right, there is much more freedom here. Even in a two-dimensional space, there are an infinite number of directions in which we can move from a given point. Now, recording what happens to the function value when someone moves in each one of these infinitely many directions would make me very very late for my movie time. So we are very thankful that mathematicians found a much easier way out to do this. Consider a function that takes in a two-dimensional vector as an input and outputs a real number. The trick to understand the behavior of such a function is to do so one input coordinate at a time because we have just seen how to analyze functions that take 1D input. Let x and y be the two input coordinates. So what we will do is we will first freeze the second coordinate of the input, the y coordinate, and only let the x coordinate vary. Note that this effectively forces the function to take a 1D input since the other input is frozen. However, we understand functions taking 1D input very well and can calculate its derivative the usual way. The derivative of this function with partially frozen inputs was given the name partial derivative, which sounds about right. We now unfreeze the Y coordinate and freeze the X coordinate instead and repeat the process. Note that these partial derivatives are just real numbers with a sign and magnitude. To make calculations easier, we collect all the partial derivatives in a vector which is called the gradient of the function. This process extends to high dimensions as well and if working with d-dimensional inputs, we will simply choose one coordinate at a time and freeze all other d-1 coordinates and repeat the process d times. Let's take an example to understand this better. Here we have a function and we see a point at which we wish to calculate the gradient. We also see what these partially frozen 1D functions look like, which are then used to compute the partial derivatives and finally construct the gradient. Note that there is a new definition of stationary points for multivariate functions. A point is called a stationary point if the gradient vector at that point is zero in all the coordinates. 
but as before all maxima minima and saddle points are stationary now it turns out that even though the gradient captures the function behavior if only one coordinate is changed at a time it is enough to predict everything else as well to do this we need a more powerful version of taylor's theorem for multivariate functions note that this looks very similar to the earlier taylor's theorem except that now the movement is not just left or right but an arbitrary vector because we are in multidimensional space and unlike last time where we simply multiplied the movement delta x with the derivative we must now take a dot product of the movement and the gradient however the movement still must be small otherwise this result may not hold actually this result makes a lot of sense because it basically tells us that the difference in the old and the new function values will need to add up the contributions from all the coordinates what is really nice is that the contribution of each coordinate is calculated the same old way by multiplying the movement along that coordinate with the partial derivative along that coordinate now it turns out that the gradient has this amazing property in that it gives us a direction in which taking a small step will increase the function value more than if we took an epsilon step along any other direction this proof simply uses certain properties of the dot product that we saw in our previous discussion on geometry basics and i would encourage you to try and prove this result yourself what is even more pleasing is that the direction opposite to the gradient can be similarly shown to be the direction along which taking a small step is guaranteed to decrease the function value the most The simple looking result is at the heart of some of the most powerful machine learning algorithms including gradient descent and backpropagation which we shall study in future discussions. To help you visualize the notions of partial derivatives and gradients better, here is a toy example of a real valued function over a discrete space. Light colors denote large function value, the peaks of the hills, and dark colors denote small function value, the depths of the gorges. The notions of partial derivatives have been modified suitably to work in discrete space. However, even in this toy example, we find that the peaks and the depths do offer zero gradient. There also seems to be a saddle point sitting in the middle of the grid. To understand this better, let us plot the gradient at each point using arrows, with the length of the arrow indicating the magnitude of the gradient. If we do this, then we find that gradients diverge away from minima. they diverge toward the maxima as expected at saddle points there is no consistent behavior just as we had handy rules of derivatives we also have such rules for gradients take a moment to appreciate them better note that these rules look awfully similar to the derivative rules we had seen earlier and this similarity is not an accident since after all gradients are simply vectorial collections of partial derivatives Here are a few identities that may help you while calculating gradients for commonly occurring functions in machine learning applications such as the constant function, a linear function, quadratic function and norms. And to help you practice these newly acquired tools, here are some simple exercises. Note that some of these exercises can be solved in multiple ways such as using the chain rule or one of the identities or simply from first principles. try to explore various ways of solving the same problem and see which one do you find to be the easiest before we wrap up let us use these techniques that we have gathered today to solve the salary prediction problem we saw at the beginning of this discussion recall that we are using a linear model here to predict the salary of individuals let us use a squared loss function to learn the parameters of the linear model since the loss function is differentiable first we simplify the problem by hiding the bias term inside the model vector itself next we compute the gradient with respect to a single term of the loss function recall that loss functions are usually averaged over all training points so that the learnt model does well on all points in general using simple applications of the rules and identities that we have just seen we are able to compute the gradient One point to note here is that given a d-dimensional vector that is styled as a column the quantity vv transpose is actually a d-dimensional matrix however be careful the quantity v transpose v on the other hand is simply the squared euclidean length of that vector and hence just a non-negative real number 
we will study matrices in more detail in a later discussion but for now this will suffice applying the sum rule then completes the gradient calculations and if you adopt some helpful shorthand notation to simplify the expressions we find that if w tilde is a stationary point then it must satisfy x tilde transpose x tilde times w tilde equals x tilde transpose y now if x tilde transpose x tilde is invertible then there is no problem and we readily obtain the optimal parameter values however if this matrix is non invertible then we need to use other techniques such as regularization which we will discuss shortly in another discussion in summary today we revisited calculus techniques that play a major role in designing machine learning algorithms we first looked at functions on the real line and saw how their derivatives tell us how the function output value changes if we make tiny changes to the input value then we moved on to multivariate functions and saw how the gradient plays the same role there so that's all for today folks stay amazing and i will look forward to hanging out with you in the next one